What's your style of relating? Are you monogamous? How do you define monogamy? What about open relating? How do you feel about it? Curious? Concerned? Have you dabbled? Or is it something you've committed to? Hi, this is Sarah Russell. I'm a relationship coach, dancer, and Taoist. In every episode, I'll be exploring psychedelics, well-being, or the human experience. And this one is some thoughts on open relating. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge this can be a sensitive topic. Whether you feel slightly excited or slightly nauseous right now, who we love and how is something that gets wildly and not so conscientiously debated. What happens behind closed doors, parked cars, or the beach late at night is our personal business. Um, unless you're into voyeurism and exhibitionism. Yeet! And I'm not here to yuck anyone's yum. I'll be talking about different ways of relating, and I want to emphasize that what I'm presenting are choices. And those choices are based on your preferences, and I'm not trying to prescribe a certain kind of lifestyle. My intention in questioning monogamy is to make the invisible visible, to expose expectations that are taken for granted rather than consciously discussed and consented to. This is about naming shame and shoulds and how to instead make choices from awareness from all of the variety of options that are available so that when we relate, we can foster true intimacy. Let's start by defining monogamy. It might seem obvious, but that's the problem, right? We think we know what we mean when we say that, but then we don't bother to check our definitions with each other and we just make assumptions. So if you Google it, Google says um, the practice of monogamy is the practice or state of having a sexual relationship with only one partner. Let's get into the nitty gritty of what that means to you. Okay, sexual exclusivity, right? How do we define sex? We tend to think of sex in really heteronormative terms where we think about it as P and V, you know, penis and vagina, where the goal is orgasm, specifically this kind of ejaculatory kind of orgasm. And anything that's not that tends to be culturally seen as less than, which let's be honest, is super homophobic. Um, And I deeply disagree with this definition of sex because of all of the different kinds of bodies that can experiment and pleasure themselves in all of this multitude of ways and enjoy each other in all of these different kinds of configurations means like sex isn't so cut and (laughs) dry, if you get what I mean. So sex can be a lot of different things. And Really being able to define what sex means to you, how you know you've had a sexual encounter, and making sure that you're being clear about that with the people you're having sexual encounters with so that there's not so much confusion and just assumption around what sex means to begin with. So how do you define sex? Then, how do you define a relationship? Um, I've noticed that when I say relationship, a lot of people automatically assume that I'm talking about a sexual a romantic relationship versus thinking of a friendship or a coworker. Um, and so even when we talk about like, oh, like, are we in a relationship? What do you mean? What do you mean when you ask me if we're in a relationship or like when you're saying that you're in a relationship with me? I'm in a relationship with all kinds of things. I'm in a relationship with the bunnies that hop around my yard and eat my wisteria leaves. We have a relationship. I think we have an understanding. I love them. Um, so what counts as a relationship for you? And also what counts as romantic? Um, what counts as intimate? What counts as loyalty? Being able to get really clear on what you mean by those terms. Um, cause I know like, especially with the term romantic people go, Oh, I just know it when I feel it. Um, fine. Depending on where you are on the romantic spectrum, if you're a romantic, that's going to mean something really different than if you're someone who identifies like me as a mega romantic. So getting really clear on what that means. Then the reason why we're talking about all of this, right, is because it's not such a problem when we agree. It's a problem when we disagree about these things. And we haven't had a conversation or we haven't had an agreement around these things because we just assumed that we were in agreement. So what counts as cheating? What if the person you're relating with goes to a party and kisses somebody else? Is that cheating? What if they tell you that they did it? What if they don't? Um, what about things like pornography? What about too much pornography? Is there a too much in your mind? I'm curious about that. Um, and then what about dominatrixes? 
If somebody hired a dominatrix, would that be considered cheating? I'm super curious, right? Because we all have these different ideas of what's in bounds and what's out of bounds. And I think it's a really good idea to have consent-based conversations where we talk about this so we're really clear with each other. Then there's this whole other beast of emotional infidelity, right? So what counts as being um, emotionally unfaithful? Being attracted to somebody else? Ah, what if you complain about your relationship to somebody that you know kind of has feelings for you? What if you share something really important and deeply personal to you with somebody, but you don't share it with your partner? What if you have to keep a friendship a secret, if you feel like you have to keep a friendship a secret? So we have this idea of what monogamy is, but have you really broken it down what it means to you? And then have you checked in with the people in your life to see if they share your perspective around what it means? And here's the thing. Even when we're talking about non-monogamy, monogamy is so normalized in our culture that all the standards and rules and values often carry over into open relating because we don't have a lot of great models for alternatives. Um, although, yeah, it's definitely getting better for sure. <sighs> I have no bone to pick with sexual exclusivity, but toxic monogamy specifically is something that I am going to actively challenge a lot. Now, the concept of toxic monogamy comes from the psychologist Hilary Berry, who wrote an article called Toxic Monogamy Culture, and it was an essay that was on Medium that's not available anymore, but thanks to the internet, we've got Facebook posts, Tumblr, Twitter posts um, that really break down all the bullet points that Hillary covered in that in that essay. To begin with, toxic monogamy, and again, I'm not talking about sexual exclusivity, I'm talking about toxic monogamy as a culture specifically, um, has the idea that the relationship comes first, that the relationship is more important than the people in the relationship. So people will self-sacrifice themselves in order to keep the relationship going. It's also this idea that if the love is intense enough, true enough, that you'll never be attracted to anybody else, Within that is also this normalization of jealousy as this idea that like, oh, if somebody's jealous, it means they love me. So almost like this upliftment of jealousy is, oh, like somebody cares. That's a good thing. And again, I'm not trying to demonize jealousy. Jealousy is a completely normal human emotion. Um, I wrote an article about this that should be coming out on Trends with Benefits soon um, that you know, I'll point you to that you can check out later. So I'm not trying to villainize jealousy, but at the same time, I'm not trying to say it's a good thing either. Like, oh yeah, like that's so hot. They got so jealous. They must really love me. Mm -mm. Knock that off. Um, there's also this idea that if there's enough love, if it's true enough, if it's pure enough, if it's real enough, that love will conquer all and love will solve all of the logistics. All of your practical incompatibilities will disappear if you just love each other enough. Mm -hmm. You can tell how I feel about that. Also, the expectation that you should meet your partner's every need. And if you don't, you're not enough or they want too much. And, you know, I could do a whole other podcast on marriage in particular, but it's this idea that, you know, once upon a time, um, people got married in order to like join adjacent land. And then it was a way to build wealth so that like your neighbors didn't want to go to war with you to try to steal your wealth. And then it was a way to create children to work the farm. Um, and then it was this way to like, come, you know, like again, combining, combining financial resources, but then there was supposed to be love as well. And then after the love, there was supposed to be like spiritual compatibility and growth and evolution and like, like relationships just, they, it asks a lot of us right now. And asking all of that from one person feels intense to me personally. <sighs> Within toxic monogamy is also this idea that commitment is synonymous with exclusivity. So if you don't want to be with just one person, then you have a fear of commitment or there's a lack of commitment in some way. And this idea that if you wanted to be with more than one person, you don't want to be committed rather than this idea that love is abundant and maybe you actually are committing yourself to multiple people in really caring, connected ways. Um, also, the idea that your insecurities are your partner's responsibility and they have to manage your insecurities for you. Otherwise, they don't love you. Otherwise, it's not a committed relationship. Also, <laughs> I, was, I was guilty of this for a long time. This is something I had to work through personally. And again, I'll get into this in future podcasts, I promise. But this idea that 
your value to your partner is directly proportional to how much time and energy they spend on you, which means you're constantly in competition with everything else they spend time and energy on. And so if you're important to them, if they love you, you're supposed to get the lion's share of all of that. Also, and you know, like we're social creatures, so this this last one makes sense to me, but this idea that your value, how you see your value is intricately linked to how valuable you are to your partner. So if your partner values you, then you value yourself, which that, that feels tender. Okay, that's a lot of expectations. And it's no wonder we struggle in relationships when this kind of Cinderella idealism is baked into our beliefs around what it means to love and be loved. Luckily, there are alternatives. And like I said, like sexual exclusivity, valid, totally valid. I'm trying to come up with alternatives to toxic monogamy. So we're going to talk about non-monogamy. And within non-monogamy, like even that phrase is slightly complicated, right? Because it's this kind of umbrella term that helps us talk about this larger concept, but it's already putting itself in opposition to monogamy. So then we're kind of still uplifting monogamy as the norm saying, oh, we're either monogamous or non-monogamous rather than saying, for instance, monogamous and open Um, because we don't want to keep organizing around monogamy because then there's this idea that it's, you know, the assumed default preferred way of relating. Okay. I digress. So polyamorous. Um, Polyamorous is a Greek word meaning many loves. And just like polyamorous means many loves, there are actually many ways to be polyamorous. And one of those is hierarchical. And this might be familiar to y'all, this idea that there's a primary partner and then everyone who's not the primary partner, there may be a secondary partner and so on down the line. But often that primary partner will have veto power, right? They'll be able to say like, yes, you can. No, you can't. That makes me uncomfortable. Stop doing it. Stop relating with that person. It gives the people who are in the primary relationship a tremendous amount of power over anybody else who's not part of that primary couple. So this is, this is a tremendous amount of like couples privilege in a hierarchical relationship. That's something to watch out for in hierarchical poly. Solo poly, on the other hand, means there aren't any primary partners. Um, Although solo poly people might say they're in a primary relationship with themselves, like they're putting their relationship with themselves first. Um, And an example of like a solo poly might be someone who is, you know, in committed relationships, but chooses to always live by themselves rather than nest with one of their partners. And this isn't about a lack of commitment. Like they have loving, connected relationships, but it does mean they're not willing to follow this prescribed script for how our relationship evolves in order to be considered committed. There's also monogamish and 16 year old me used to stay up late at night scrolling through Dan Savage's column. Um, This was popularized by Dan Savage where he talked about people being monogamish. And the way Dan Savage talked about this was, okay, let's say you're in a long term committed relationship with somebody. You're going to spend your life with them or many, many years. How successful is that likely to be if you have this expectation that they're never going to want to be with anybody else? And so the way Dan Savage talked about this was like, yeah, each of you is probably going to have moments when you want to indulge in something else. And just because you want to do that or you do do that, is it worth throwing out this entire committed relationship because of this person having you know, however many experiences that didn't end up disrupting the relation too much, too much? you know, except for the fact that we have this idea of of what it means to be in a monogamous relationship. And um, within the monogamish like framework, it's this idea of, okay, like, yeah, the hundred mile rule, like you can go hook up with somebody when you're on a trip um, or like limiting the the amount of amount of availability you have. Like, this is how long I want it to last. This is how intense it, it can get. This is how many interactions. So it's kind of like all of these rules for what would still be like, what would you would probably present as a monogamous couple, except for the people that like knew that like occasionally you were often doing these other things. Then we have don't ask, don't tell, where additional relationships are quote unquote allowed, but you don't want to hear about it. So your person is off doing something and you don't want to, you like, you know, they're off doing something, but you don't want to hear about the fact that they're off doing something. And I got to tell you, for me personally, this feels like dangerous territory. Um, and I I do not want to know all of the details. I got to tell you, like, I just, I don't need all those visuals in my head. I don't, I don't need the graphic encounter. I don't need that. But at the same time, I do think it's 
something to be cautious about if the only way that you can be okay with being in an open relationship is if you can kind of pretend that it's not happening. So that would be my caution with don't ask, don't tell. All the way on the other end of the spectrum is this idea of kitchen table poly and it's the idea that everyone sits around the kitchen table and can have a fun conversation together Um, and like you're all up in each other's business with this one so your friends with your lovers lovers um, it's this idea of like oh if you're friends with them I'm friends with them too which is really sweet and I gotta tell you challenging for me because ta-da we've arrived at relationship anarchy. And relationship anarchy is how I identify. It's my preferred way of moving through the world. And like contrary to kitchen table poly, I want to be able to choose all of the people that I'm friends with. And I'm not going to make you be friends with my people. And I'm certainly not going to let you make me be friends with your people. I'll be cordial and polite and respectful. But there's this autonomy in relationship anarchy, which I really value. Um, And Andy Nordgren wrote the short instructional manifesto for relationship anarchy, which I can't recommend highly enough. And I'm going to be getting into that in detail in future podcasts because, again, it's just something that I love talking about. But a little bit about relationship anarchy um, is it's very much about customizing your commitments, about figuring out what works for you. And it's also this like lack of entitlement where you don't feel entitled to your partners or you know you're not entitled to your partner's time and energy and they're not entitled to yours. And RA is really critical of this conventional standard that prioritizes both sexual relationships and romantic relationships over all other relationships. So RA is really trying to get rid of those hierarchical hierarchical values and distinctions Um, like the person that you're having sex with is the most important person in your life. They get all your time. They get all your energy. They're the priority. That can happen, but it's not this assumed expectation. Like also your your platonic friendships, um, your family, your creative artistic relationships, like all of those get to have their place. And we don't just have this automatic hierarchy within relationship anarchy. That was a lot of information. And um, Franklin View has this Venn diagram that he calls the map of non-monogamy. And there like are even more ways than I listed on this podcast. And you can go check it out and see all the different ways that people can experiment with this and, and come up with what works for them in particular. But I really want to emphasize that it's really easy to start saying monogamy is better or the best in some way or open relating is better or the best in some way. And I really want to like dismantle that, right? So we can have this idea that monogamy means you're super committed. You're super loyal. Um, There can just be like this really strong sense of devotion in monogamy. So that's what's right and that's what's good. And then on the flip side, we can go to open relating where like you're, you're more evolved, like you have managed your jealousy, you've worked through your shit, um, you have this big open heart, you're capable of loving so much more. I just like really want to break down those super dualistic, oversimplistic ways of organizing around relating. And I want this to be about your preferences and what works for you at a particular moment in time, at a particular place with specific people, right? So this is relationship by relationship, depending on where you are in your life. I want this to be about choice for you. And so some of this might be a yes for you. Some of this might be a no. Some of this might be a maybe, but really being able to customize for yourself how you show love, how you receive love, how you want to show up in the world. I'll leave you with this excerpt from No Longer Playing It Safe by Bell Hooks. To begin the practice of love, we must slow down and be still enough to bear witness in the present moment. If we accept that love is a combination of care, commitment, knowledge, responsibility, respect, and trust, we can then be guided by this understanding. We can use these skillful means as a map in our daily life to determine right action. When we cultivate the the mind of love, we are cultivating the good, and that means recovering the incandescent power of love that is present as a potential in all of us, and using the tools of spiritual practice to sustain our real, 
moment to moment experience of that vision. To be transformed by the practice of love is to be born again, to experience spiritual renewal. What I witness daily is the longing for that renewal and the fear that our lives will be changed utterly if we choose love. That fear paralyzes. It leaves us stuck in suffering. When we commit to love in our daily life, habits are shattered because we are no longer playing by the safe rules of the status quo. Love moves us to a new ground of being. We are necessarily working to end domination. This movement is what most people fear. If we are to galvanize the collective longing for spiritual well-being that is found in the practice of love, we must be more willing to identify the forms that longing will take in daily life. Folks need to know the ways we change and are changed when we love. You can find more information on my Instagram at Be The Radical Way and go to Trends With Benefits to check out all of our written work on psychedelics, well-being, and the human experience. I hope you get some good loving.